Hey everybody, welcome back to Electrical Code Academy. My name is Paul Abernathy. I'm the instructor for today. And we're going to be talking about general receptacle placements in this episode. Uh, for somebody that's been in the field for many years, it becomes old hat. Where do you put receptacles? How do you space them? Um, all the things you have to think about. Um, it becomes old hat for you. But if you're really wanting to know where things are supposed to be and not just assume where they're supposed to be, then that's when you get into a good course like ours. And so with that, I want to talk to those out there who need to learn the National Electrical Code. Maybe you're an apprentice. Maybe you're a journeyman and you're struggling with the NEC. There is no better way to learn the National Electrical Code than in our programs. So do me a favor. If you just go to this website right here, Fast Track System dot com go to any of our video our courses and watch our videos watch our demos but if you're trying to really learn the national electrical code uh, for an exam then you want to look at our fast tracks black program it's based on the national electrical code it's acceptable in every state um, we teach the nec only okay for electrical electrical exams okay um, we don't get into OSHA, we don't get into safety, we don't get into local rules. We purely teach the National Electrical Code, but we teach it at a very high level. And our course is very extensive, 19 units, well over 1,200 exam style questions, competency reviews. You can join me on Wednesday nights. Um, or you can even get the Fast Tracks Plus, which also gives you 12 month access to our exclusive video platform. This is something new that is called Fast Tracks Tube. Dot com or Fast Tracks TV, if you like, you can use that as well. And it has videos that teach the National Electrical Code, but it's not just videos from me. I am bringing in all kinds of instructors into this platform. Okay, Some very well-known instructors will also be featured on this platform because we want you to learn the NEC. It's not about just my content there. We want to help you learn the NEC, but we want to get rid of all the flutter from everywhere else and purely focus on the electrical industry. Basically a YouTube for electricians only and that's what it is, FastTracksTube.com. So check that out, it's an annual subscription. But if you sign up now, you can get $25 off that annual subscription by just simply using the coupon code 25OFF, all caps, 25OFF at checkout, you'll get $25 off your annual subscription. And you're gonna get access to some amazing videos. Uh, you're gonna get our grounding and bonding series that's in there, it's about 12 hours, I believe. Um, we have a real extensive program on uh, swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs. That is worth it alone. If you were to have bought that or attended that series, you would have paid way more than that. So you're getting access to all of that, plus so much more, and we're adding new videos every week. So it's really going to be an amazing platform. But if you're studying for the NEC, go to this website right here and look at our Fast Tracks Black. Now, if you're already licensed and you're already an electrician, journeyman, or even a master, maybe you want a deep dive. Well, we've got courses for you and we're talking extensive. We have a Fast Tracks Red program for residential. We have a green program for commercial. We have a blue program for industrial. We even have something called Magenta, which is industrial electricity, and that is a very high level, okay? That's almost like engineering level. You'll learn so much stuff in that. We also have a purple course, which is grounding and bonding. Some of the best grounding and bonding images and graphics and illustrations that you're gonna see anywhere to hammer these things home. We've got electrical theory courses. So it's not just for exam prep, folks. We help electricians who are good become great electricians in our courses with amazing illustrations. And you always get access to what? Our Wednesday night sessions if you wanna ask questions. I'm here to help you, okay? And I'm very hands-on on everything. Anybody that's ever reached out to me know that I answer phones, I do review of the code questions, I do all competency reviews, um, I'm there to host Wednesday nights. I am very active with my students and I have been doing that for over 32 years. If you wanna know who I am and you wanna trust a resource and you're saying, well, anybody can just go on YouTube or Facebook, grab your code book, go to the front of your code book and look at code panel five and code panel seven. You're gonna see my name there. And I'm not saying that to brag. What I'm saying is that you can trust the resource. There's a lot of educators out there 
but how many of them work that closely with the NEC? Um, I've been serving on code panels for years, and I tell you what, I literally have a passion for teaching people the National Electrical Code. So I encourage you to go verify me, okay? Google me if you want. I'm here to help you learn. And that's what our program is all about. So give it a shot. All right, so now today we're gonna to talk about general receptacle placements. And this might be multiple video series on this one, uh, but this most certainly will be part one and we'll see how much we can cover in this episode. So let's kind of go look at it. So here's what we got, folks. We're gonna be talking receptacles today. Uh, we're gonna be spending most of our time in Article 210, and we're gonna be in Section 52. And that's generally talks about most of our placement type of requirements. So if you've got your code book, and I've obviously got link all geared up so we can go look at the code where we need to, uh, we're gonna follow the same principles that we always do. Anytime you see some chevrons, pause this video, go read the code section that it references, and then come back and hit play and keep on getting it. Uh, that way you can get the most out of these educational series. Right? So let's talk general receptacle placement. So we're talking about bedrooms, living rooms, where we put these receptacles. So wall space determines the minimum number of receptacles in a given dwelling. Okay, how much wall space you have, measuring it out, it's gonna help define how many receptacles you actually have. Receptacle outlets shall be installed in kitchens, family rooms, dining rooms, living rooms, parlors, libraries, dens, sunrooms, uh, bedrooms, recreation rooms, or similar rooms or areas in accordance with the provisions specified in 210.52a, okay? So when I talk to people about receptacles, I always tell them the holy grail of receptacle placement is obviously in 210.52, okay? That's where you're gonna go. Anytime you have an exam question, it talks about how many how many feet from a doorway should I do I have to put a receptacle? And all of those type of things are gonna reside in section 52 of article 210. So it's kind of one of your go-tos that you'll start to remember. You're giving me a question about receptacle placement. I'm gonna to go to 210.52 and then I'm gonna bold scan through um, and I'm gonna find the answer, okay? All right, so let's start looking at it. So here we begin, we've got a nice illustration of a room and we're gonna show how we would lay this room out. Now this is laying it out to the maximum, okay? Obviously you could put more receptacles than you want. But we're putting in the number, the specific number, that would make us compliant to the NEC. You can always have more, okay? You can always go above the NEC, but for exams, typically they want you to follow what the NEC says. In the real world, you're gonna work with your customer and you're gonna put additional receptacles where necessary, but you at least have to meet the minimums, all right? So let's talk about it right here. All right, A, A is pointing right here. A is pointing right here. A is pointing right here. Now what is, it, the commonality between all of these that it's calling out, they're all within six feet of a break in the wall line. Okay, so this receptacle is within six feet of this break in the doorway. This receptacle is within six feet of this break. It's within six feet of this break. And this one right here is within six feet of this break in the door. Okay, right here, break in the wall. So what does it say? It says receptacles shall be installed so that no point measured horizontally along the floor line of any wall space is more than six feet from a receptacle outlet. Okay, so that's what it says in 210.52a1. It's a great time to pause and read what that says in the code. And by the way, in our Fast Tracks program, we use these chevrons specifically for that. Anytime you see a chevron, we expect the student to stop. Obviously read what's there, stop and then go to the code and read what the code says. Why do we do that? Because that moves a student in and out of the reading material into the code book and then they come back to the material. It makes them a little more comfortable with the material, but it also helps them learn where things are in the NEC. So that when they're in a stressful situation in an exam, they're getting familiar with going into that code book and finding these things out. And it just kind of helps raise that comfort level. Now, if you're in the field, you most certainly need to learn how to navigate the NEC. So anytime you see a code reference, getting into the NEC is gonna be so beneficial for you. It's just gonna make you better, trust me. It's one of those things that after time, it just becomes habit forming and you're gonna just be able to whip in and out of that NEC. You're gonna be able to look at a question, 
dissect the key root of that question, and boom, you're off the town. Why? Repetition. Doing things over and over again. There's a method to the madness, so you have to trust me on this, okay? All right, so here you see this receptacle obviously is within six feet, so if I were to put a lamp right here, uh, I have to be within six feet of a receptacle, so it would be. Now, B, the maximum distance between receptacles is 12 feet. Now, you're probably saying, okay, what do you mean? I thought it says at any point in a wall line, you can't be more than six feet from a receptacle outlet. Now, I'll remind you that a receptacle outlet is the actual box in the wall. Okay, a receptacle is a device that goes in that receptacle outlet box. Okay, subtle, but it can be important as you move through the code, understanding that devices are the receptacle, devices are switches. Outlets is the location where we're taking the power from the system. Okay, so I'm putting a device in that outlet box. I'm putting a switch in that switch box. Okay, that's a outlet box. Okay, just things to think about as you're starting to your journey and, and really lock all these things in. It may be old hat for you, but it certainly is worth reiterating again. Now, why 12 feet between this one and this one? Because if I were to go right here in the middle of this, these two, it's six feet and then six feet, I'm at right in the middle. I am within six feet of this receptacle on the left, and I am within six feet of this receptacle on the right. So this point of the wall, I am always within six feet of a receptacle. So if I go a maximum 12 feet apart, anywhere in this wall line, if I go right here, I am within six feet of a receptacle. I wouldn't be within six feet of this one, but I am within six feet of this one. So I am compliant. So that's where you hear us talk about this old saying, six foot, 12 foot rule. That's what it means. Six feet from a break in the floor line, and then the, the distance between receptacles could go up to 12 feet so that no point along the wall line am I more than six feet from a receptacle, okay? Now, you notice here is another break in the wall line. Then this receptacle is 12 feet from this one, but it has to be within six feet from this one. Now, in the real world, that may not do. Maybe this one is 12 feet from this one, but now maybe it's eight feet from the break in the door. What does that mean? then you're gonna to have to put another receptacle here. So that usually means that instead of using this 12 feet, I'm probably gonna move this receptacle a little bit to the left. Maybe it's only eight feet from the other receptacle in order to be able to get another one in here and make it look nice on the wall. Okay, that's an aesthetic thing. Um, and so you might have to add more receptacles to be compliant. But this drawing just shows you the minimum necessary to meet compliance, okay? So here's the break. You got to have one within six feet, and there it is right here. And then you can go up to 12 feet. Don't have to go to 12 feet. You can go to eight feet. You could go to nine feet, but you could, go, you could go all the way up to 12 feet. And you put a receptacle right here, and then you go another 12 feet, put a receptacle. And as long as that one here is within six feet of the end of this opening of this break in the wall, then that's all you would need, and you're done. Okay? So just remember. From an opening, doorway, things like that, and we'll look a little deeper into the code for this, but remember, a break in the floor line, okay, on the wall line, then you could go, you have to go six feet, so let's say a doorway, right, then, uh, or a fireplace, or a fixed shelving that's built into the wall, that type of thing, then that's kind of considered a break in the wall line, okay, just like if it was an opening, okay, you got to go read the code because it gives you some scenarios, folks in that. And so in this case, um, you're measuring from that break and you have to have a receptacle within six feet. So these are pretty evident, right? There's a doorway, doorway, doorway. So that is obviously a break in the wall line. That those make it pretty easy to understand. All right, so we got C here. So let's see, general receptacle placement requirements for a 125 volt, 15 and 20 amp receptacle outlet are in 210.52. So again, I was telling you that earlier, reiterated that that is the holy grail, right? That is the holy grail of receptacle placement requirements in 210.52. Of course, it's also 210.52A, then there's a B, and there's a C. Again, so we're talking for kitchen, kitchens as well, and all that. So there's a lot there, but that's where you're gonna go, right? Now, caution. 
says the receptacles required by 210.52a through i shall be in addition to any receptacle that is number one, part of a luminaire or appliance, number two, controlled by a listed wall mounted control device in accordance with 210.70a1, exception number one, I'll explain that in a minute, number three, located within cabinets or cupboards, and number four, located more than five and a half feet above the floor. This is all covered in 210.52, by the way, so I'm gonna kinda explain each one of these. So, these receptacles are these general purpose receptacles. And these you have to have based on that six foot, 12 foot example that we gave you, right? Um, but you could have a luminaire or an appliance with a built-in receptacle. Well, that's okay, but it can't take the place of these general receptacle placement. It's just an extra one, okay? So you could have it in an appliance in the room, but it can't qualify as the ones that are required by 210.52, okay? Can't meet that. Now, the next one, controlled by a listed wall-mounted control device in accordance with 210.70A1, exception number one. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, let me give you an example. Your bedroom. Maybe you don't want to have a light in the ceiling. Well, 210.70, okay, the exception under 210.70A1 says, you know what? You know what? I'll let you switch a receptacle in lieu of a lighting outlet. Okay but you can't switch the whole receptacle. Why? Because it wouldn't meet the 210.52 spacing requirement. It has to be a receptacle that's there, powers on all the time, not where you can switch it off. Now that doesn't mean that we have to um, put a switch to meet the permanent requirement that we show in this illustration and add another receptacle and switch it. No, we could simply take a duplex receptacle, remember that's two receptacles, break the tab on the hot side and the top one be switched and the bottom one be hot all the time. So the one that's hot all the time meets the requirements of 210.52A, no problem. The one that's switched is being switched in lieu of a lighting outlet in that room and that is permitted by 210.70A1, exception number one. Okay, very common in uh, bedrooms especially when you're doing the efficiency homes where they're trying to keep the costs down and they might not want to put luminaires in the rooms. Well, and they still have to have switched something in the room, right? So it's either a switched luminaire or they can switch a receptacle. You just can't switch the entire receptacle. You can switch half of it and leave the other half hot and the hot part would meet the spacing requirements and then the other half meets the switching requirement in lieu of the lighting outlet. Okay, now be careful. There are some places in the code that you can't do that, right? So it's important that you be really aware of that switching, right? So again, we're going to cover that in other episodes. We're really talking about spacing and placement now. But, you know, I'll just give you a hint. One of the locations where you can't obviously do that is in bathrooms, right? So, but again, we'll get into that in another episode. We're just talking spacing and placement at this time. Uh, the next one, it says, located in cabinets and cupboards. So, you know, I might have a receptacle that's in a cabinet, but that can't take the place of my general receptacle layout, okay? It's just extra. It can be in there. That's not a problem, right? But I'm, I'll give you another example. A receptacle in a kitchen that's serving the countertop, if I have a receptacle up in the cabinet for some reason, all right, that is not going to replace the ones that are still required for your spacing around the kitchen <coughs> and the spacing on the countertop, which we haven't covered yet, which is called the two foot, four foot rule. Um, but we haven't really gotten into that spacing yet. But the point is, I might have a receptacle in a cabinet, but that's not going to meet the spacing rules. So we have they can be there, but they're going to have to have one that's out on the wall available to meet the spacing rule in 210.52, okay? And then lastly, located more than five and a half feet above the floor. So let me give you an example here. Say this is my bedroom and I'm laying out my receptacles, a six foot, 12 foot rule, but I want a receptacle up high for a flat screen TV. Now, if that receptacle is, let's say it's this one right here, okay? So it, let's say it meets the spacing and you put it up four feet 
That's perfectly fine. Nothing says it has to be 16 inches off the floor, 18 inches off the floor. It could be two feet off the floor. Nothing says that it can be. But the moment that it goes higher than five and a half feet, then I would have no receptacle in this wall space. And essentially, I'd have nothing for this whole span. For 18 feet, I would have nothing as far as the coach determined, because I put that receptacle up higher than five and a half feet. So I would have to add a receptacle down low. That doesn't mean that I can't have a receptacle above five and a half feet. Sure, I can. But I still have to have a receptacle down below five and a half feet to meet my placement requirements around the room. Make sense? Um, so again, you'll see a lot of people that'll have uh, the TVs with the receptacles behind it and they'll be feeding them from a receptacle that's down low that's meeting the spacing requirement, but they needed to just get power up higher so they can supply that flat screen TV. Perfectly okay uh, to do that, but you gotta remember the spacing rules, okay? So any of these that you see right here, these are, are can't take the place of the normal receptacle placements that you would have in 210.52A through I. Can't take the place of those. You can have them, but they can't take their place. All right, note, dwelling unit receptacle outlet general provisions specified in 210.52 apply to any part of a basement containing habitable rooms such as dens, recreation rooms, etc. So again, downstairs, if you have dwelling unit receptacles and you have a, uh, a basement, then guess what? If it's considered a habitable room, and it will be, you have to make sure that you still meet the spacing requirements down there as well. Now, if it's an unfinished basement, no, you don't, okay? But if it's a finished basement, this 210.52 is going to apply to spacing of the receptacles. You can't have a client just say, oh, I want one here, I want one there, I want one there. No, we have to meet the minimum six foot, 12 foot spacing requirements. Uh, and of course, you can deviate from that. You don't have to be six and 12. You could be six and eight, right? as long as you're six feet from a door opening, but you could be four feet. You could put it at three feet from a door opening if you want, okay? You just can't exceed six feet. And from receptacle to receptacle, you can't exceed 12 feet because you can't be more than six feet from anywhere on the wall that you touch. You can't be more than six feet from a receptacle. So that's our spacing. We call that the six foot, 12 foot rule, okay? All right, let's talk about wall space, right? So. When we're thinking of that wall space and we're thinking of the receptacles, sometimes you're gonna have smaller wall spaces. Maybe a space between the door that enters into your bedroom and then you have a closet door and you have that wall space between it. Does a receptacle go there or not? Is that wall space, again, it, we're measuring out for receptacles and you say, well, I gotta have one within six feet of the door, but, uh, but maybe that wall space is only 23 inches between the door to enter the bedroom and the door that enters the closet. Do you have to have a receptacle in that wall space? Well, let's look here. So here's what it says in the code, and you'd be looking at 210.52A21, and it says a receptacle is required for any wall space two feet or more in width, and it includes a space measured around corners, unbroken along the floor line, by doorways or similar openings, fireplaces or fixed cabinets, and you heard me talk about that earlier, that do not have countertops or similar work surfaces, okay? So, what do we, and we're talking about fixed cabinets that do not have countertops or uh, similar work surfaces. So it's just a cabinet, okay? Like a bookshelf cabinet. If it's going from floor to ceiling or whatever and it's permanent, then that is almost like a break in the wall. And you start your measurement from the end of that fixed cabinet, right? Okay? All right, so um, thinking of it that way. Now, if it's a cabinet that's kind of short and it has a work surface on it or a countertop on it, then that does not break the uh, wall space and you're gonna still have to maintain your spacing in that cabinet. And remember, if you put the receptacle in the cabinet, that's not gonna qualify. It would have to be outside of the cabinet, maybe above the cabinet, not more than five and a half feet to meet that spacing rule, okay? Way important things to, to really understand. Um, and hopefully you're getting it. If not, what do I always say? You can reach me by going to our website. There it is right there. And you have a contact us feature. You can send us an email. But if you want your 
your question to really be answered quickly and to potentially be on a podcast, make you famous, but not say your name. I'm not going to give the names, but again, we'll talk about your issue. Then also you can go to paulabernathy.com. It's a website that I set up under my name in order to be able to ask your questions and I answer your questions. So you get even more resources uh, from our company. We're here to try to help you. All right. We, we create the most of what I believe the most affordable, full, inclusive program out there. And the support that you get is unmatched by anybody. We're not just selling you a book or a DVD. You can even speak to me and I will help you understand it the best that I can. And that's I don't know. Put a price on that. OK, somebody always there to answer those questions for you. That customer support that you really need. OK. All right. So let's kind of look back at here. All right. So let's look at what we've got here. Um, we've got this wall space right here. It measures 23 inches. So no receptacle will be required. And that's what it says here in 210.52A21. It's only for wall spaces that are two feet or more. So 23 inches is not two feet, no receptacle. So if this was between a closet and the entry into the bedroom, that piece of wall right there, no receptacle would be required. You may put one, but it's not required. Now, that same wall space, if it was measured 24 inches or greater, then you're going to have to have a receptacle in there. OK, so if this one the example is this one's 24 inches exactly between the door opening and the edge of a fireplace or an edge of a fixed cabinet, right, with no shelving on it, um, then guess what? Or the edge of a doorway. If that is 24 inches, then you're going to need a receptacle there. OK. Another myth that people have, and I'm just going to throw it out there. This one shows the ground up. Can you have the ground up or the ground down? The code doesn't care. That's another myth that people seem to perpetuate out there. They say, oh, you got to have grounds up, grounds down. Well, this is what we do in our city or this is what we do in our town or our state. OK, that may be true. Maybe your state amended something or did something weird. But as far as the NEC code is concerned, we don't care if it's up, down, left or right. Now, using logic. Typically, if you're going to do it sideways, then you're going to do it with the neutral side up. Uh, or if you're going to do it with the ground up in commercial applications where they use metal cover plates, they tend to like the ground up. Why? Because if the cover plate comes loose and falls down on the attachment plug is maybe sticking out a little bit, then it's going to fall down and the metal cover plate is going to hit the equipment ground uh, terminal. That's from the attachment plug, right? The round one that goes in there, uh, then it's going to hit that. So a lot of people like to have the ground up if they're using metal cover plates, but there's nothing in the code. Now, that's not to say you have a local ordinance. OK, so again, that would supersede the code. But when I teach the code, folks, I'm teaching the national electrical code. I cannot teach your local jurisdiction. I can't teach what you might have amendments. It's too many states and too many amendments. I'm trying to teach people all over the country. So I stick to the NEC, make it simple for us, and it teaches you what you need to know. There's nowhere in the code that says the orientation up or down, left or right of a receptacle. Now, there are code requirements about receptacles being face up on cabinets, for example, or underneath a cupboard, okay, under a sink in the kitchen, can't be face up. But you also see that it's okay to have receptacles in the floor, and those are face up but they have special boxes designed for those, okay? So, so many rules to learn. And in our Fast Tracks program, you learn all those things. That's why it's so extensive. All right, so let's talk about maximum distance to a receptacle. And again, we kind of looked at it and I kind of gave you all this already. So this should be just, this will hammer it home. Let's put it that way. This will hammer it home. So let's look at A. So here's your typical layout in your room. OK, this is the end of this. Say it's a doorway over here. Right. And you got your receptacle. And this one's within six feet of the doorway, let's say. Right. And then it goes from here. It goes to here. That is 12 feet between these two. OK. If I put a lamp right in the middle, that six foot cord would reach this receptacle or it reaches this receptacle. Same as over here. So that's all we're saying. The six foot, 12 foot rule means six feet from an opening or break in the wall line. And you can go a maximum of 12 feet because if you did so, if you went right in the middle and touched the wall, you'd be within six feet of that receptacle, six feet of that receptacle. You move one foot to the left or one foot to the right, 
you're still within six feet of that receptacle. Or if you move this way, you're within six feet of that receptacle. That's what you're trying to do. The standard cord is six foot in length. So we have to make sure that we're discouraging the use of extension cords. So thus we call this six foot, 12 foot rule to make it simple to remember, right? So here you go. It says an easy way to understand the placement of dwelling receptacle is to imagine having a floor lamp with a six foot cord. Anywhere this lamp is placed around the wall, there should be a receptacle within reach without using an extension cord. That's what we're trying to achieve, right? Now, even when placed beside a door opening, the outlet should be within reach, right? Because it's supposed to be one within six feet of a break in the, in the wall line, right? It says, if the lamp is placed next to, next to a wall with at least 24 inches wide, right? So maybe that's that space between the entry into the bedroom and a closet, right? An outlet should be available within that wall space because again, two feet or more, requires an outlet. So maybe that is the perfect place to put a lamp. And that's why the code requires one to be there if it's two feet or more in wall space. Kind of see how all that works? Um, it's all done for a reason, folks. It's, it's not to overcome. Now, can I have more in here than this? Could I have one at six feet, then have one right here at six feet, then I have another one right here at six feet, and then have another one say, sure, you could if you wanted to. But that's not what you're going to be tested on on an exam. We're going to want to know what the rules are, and it's assumed that you're going to be as efficient, efficient as possible. So the 6 foot, 12 foot rule will be the most efficient way to do the installation. But in the real world, you can put as many as you want. Okay? That's not a problem. There's, no, there's nothing in the code that says uh, the receptacle, other than to meet the spacing, you could add a bunch of extra ones if you want to. It's, it's totally up to you. Okay. Now, B, right here, is the maximum distance to any receptacle along the floor line of any wall space measured horizontally, and it shall be, shall be six feet, okay? So, again, oops, let me shut this right here. So, again, wherever I put this lamp with this six-foot cord, I'm going to be within reach of a receptacle. Now, when you're measuring the wall line, Again, this is where people sometimes will think, well, when I'm measuring it, what about the room is not perfectly square? What if it has it? Then you're going to follow the contours of the actual room. Okay, so here you see right here, here's a receptacle, and then the maximum distance is 12. So 5 plus 4, 9, plus 3 is 12. But here you measure to the corner, then measure this wall space, and then from this corner you measure this one. So together, this is 12. But you measure what? You measure around the corners. Okay, so an electrician with a tape, typically I would measure from here to here, and then I go around and measure here to here, and then I would measure here to here, because that gives me fixed points to try to measure rather than try to drape out this tape, that type of thing. Okay? But you measure around the walls, the contour of the walls. Fixed panels. So in that wall, when you're doing your measurement, some people say, well, Paul, how do I address maybe there's a sliding door? Maybe this is a living room and I'm doing my six foot, 12 foot measurements um, or, or kind of what about a fixed sliding door? Well, you've got two pieces to a sliding door. You got the sliding portion and you got the fixed portion. I'm going to keep it simple for you. The fixed portion of a sliding door is considered wall space. You treat it like it's a wall. It might be glass. But for all intents and purposes, imaginary that it is just that gypsum board extends all the way out to the edge of the fixed portion, right? So in this case right here, if we're measuring and you know the rule is we have to have a, a receptacle within six feet of the opening, well, you measure from the edge of the portion that doesn't slide and you measure six feet and there's that receptacle right there. Could it be at five feet? Yes. Could it be at four feet? Yes. But it's got, can't be more than six feet away. But you, this fixed portion, counts as wall space, okay? Now, the sliding portion makes sense. Slides open, that's a break in the floor line along the wall space. So your measurement starts here at the edge, and then it goes, has to be within six feet from this side. This is your break in the wall, and this is your break in the floor line right here. And you measure six feet. And then from this one here, I could go what? I could go up to 12 feet, okay? But that's how you treat the break uh, in, the, in the floor line uh, on a wall when we're talking about a sliding glass door, 
Okay. Now, where do you get all this? Again, what do I say to do in the, in the, in the program? Here are these chevrons. Go and read it because that's what's going to give you basically the information that we tell you here. But if you're in the program and you spent good money for the program or you're watching this video, you want to get the best out of it. Pause the video. Look at that code reference and go to your code book. Read it. Nothing should take the place of really reading the code. And even if we paraphrase it here, the concept is for you to read it and it helps you comprehend it. Because you see what we said, then you go and read it, then you come back and you look at the illustration again, and it all starts to make sense. Folks, this isn't done by accident. This is done for a reason. Right? This is what makes our course so much different than everybody else's. I can tell you right now, you go online and you Google exam prep or electrical, and you're going to see books after books after books that, that claim to teach you to prepare for an electrical exam. The problem with those is that it usually is heavily just questions and answers. That's not going to build on your knowledge base. You need something that gives you the code, works you into the code book. It's worth your investment. And being an electrician is a career. This is your living. This is your job. This is why we teach it this way. I want you to be able to retain this stuff. That's why it's so important to me personally. Okay. So anyway, now let's look at C. It says the maximum distance to any receptacle along the floor line measured horizontally shall be six feet. Okay, that's in 210.52A1. And so as you see right here, six feet from the break in the wall line right there, that floor line at the wall, six feet. Right here, other side of the break, okay, in that floor line right here, measured six feet, receptacle. Now, could it be at five, four, three, two? Absolutely but the maximum is six feet, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about fixed room dividers because that's gonna come up as you start going through 210.52. And you're like, well, first of all, what's a fixed room divider? It could be um, a railing, uh, it could be a cabinet, it, or, or something that actually divides a room. It might be a freestanding bar countertop, maybe in your kitchen, you actually have an island that's actually a counter that's separating the living room from the kitchen. Maybe that is the room divider, okay? Every layout's different. But you know, electricians have to take all these things into consideration and an, and an inspector has to work with you because they also have to look at these things and take it all into consideration. Uh, but we're gonna give you one when it comes to rail, we're gonna make it very simple. All right, so let's look at this right here. So here's a room. And it's kind of weird. I don't know why this would be here. Um, only time I typically see something like this is maybe there's some steps right here going down to a landing in a split level. And this is kind of overlooking that stairs that go down. That's where it was in my house years ago when I was back in Virginia. Um, so at any rate, here's your railing. Okay. Now let's leave what it says here. A, it says... The space afforded by a fixed room divider, such as railings or freestanding bar type counters. Now, when it says such as, it does not mean just these two examples. So again, it could be some other divider that divides rooms or spaces. And it may not be railings, okay? It may be a freestanding bar type counter, okay? It might be a freestanding like a half wall bookshelf, okay? Those are fixed room dividers and things like that. Now, if it's a wall with gypsum board on it, then it's just a wall, like a normal wall. Even if it's a knee-high wall, it's still a wall, okay? So you would have your receptacle requirements, and those would be like we discussed before, right? So again, this is not an all-inclusive list when you see such as railings or freestanding bar-type counters. So you got to use some common sense. But in this case, we're going to say this right here is a, is a, you know, a railing. Here it is right here. Now, the receptacle outlet in or on the floor are permitted. Receptacles located more than 18 inches from the wall or room divider may not be counted as the required receptacle. Okay, so let's point. Now, that is in 210.52A3. So let's talk about that for a second. Floor receptacles. Can I have floor receptacles instead of the receptacles that are actually in the wall? Absolutely. 
um, as long as they're located within 18 inches of the wall. If they're any further than that, like maybe you put it out in the middle of the floor for a lamp, uh, maybe that's your floor design and it's out in the middle where you'd have a, a coffee table and a recliner and it is out in the middle, then that's an extra one. That is certainly not meeting the wall requirements. That's just an extra one. You could have extra ones all over the place, right? Um, but in this case, if you look at here, um, here's the end of that wall, or in this case, bar. But if this could have been, if this was a half knee wall uh, with gypsum on it, just like these walls over here, then it would still be a wall, and so it would still apply. Here from the edge, you come in and it can't be more than six feet, right there. Now, we're obviously not going to put it up in this railing, so that's why this one's on the floor. But if this was gypsum board and this was a half wall, a knee wall, or whatever it was, then you would expect it to be mounted in the wall. But could it be in the floor? Absolutely, as long as it's not more than 18 inches. Now, the, the cost factor to do this is probably, in this case, it's the only thing you could do because it's, again, it's rails. Um, but um, the only other time that I've ever seen us use floor receptacles like this is where I've done a dwelling before where it had one wall of the house was nothing but glass. And people argued and, and people said, well, I can't put it in. Obviously, you can't put it in the glass, but you still have to have the receptacles. It's still considered wall space, right? It's fixed like that fixed sliding door. It's still wall space. So you'd have to put them in the floor. Now, in this case, the customers were going crazy because it was a concrete floor and I still needed those receptacles. And so they had to put receptacles that were in the floor and they were special boxes, special floor type boxes because they were in the concrete and they were expensive, but they, they had to have them because I had to have those receptacles. And that receptacle had to be within what? 18 inches of the wall in order to qualify to meet the wall space requirement. Okay? So it is okay to put them in the floor. Just you gotta, again, you gotta install them within 18, 18 inches of the wall to qualify. Note. Not all types of receptacle boxes are suitable for floor installations. That is so true, folks. Um, a lot of people are just sticking nail-ups down there and other things like that. Again, not all of them are suitable for it. Okay, so make sure you do pick one that's suitable. There's different types of boxes may be required for different types of floor construction. Uh, that is wood or concrete. In our case, it had special boxes that were designed to go in the concrete. Um, Receptacle floor boxes must be listed specifically for the type of floor in which they are to be installed. Where does it say that? Again, code references, folks, 314.27b. Take the time. This is important. Pause. Go look that up in the code. All right? I'm not going to do that for you this time because I want you to do it. Pause this video. Go read it. And then come on back and you'll see why this all makes sense. All right, let's talk about miscellaneous receptacles. So we already learned about the spacing. Um, we've learned about um, how we do that. We haven't covered kitchens yet. That may or may not be in this episode, spacing. But again, it's, if it's not, it's going to be in the next episode we do. So look for it. Uh, but this spacing is, we'll just call this miscellaneous receptacle spacing in addition to those that are required by 210.52. So here you go. And we saw them earlier. We touched on them a little bit, but here we're going to get a little more detail. Remember, luminaires or appliances with the built-in receptacles, they're permitted, okay? But these receptacles do not count for the spacing requirement. But you can have them if you want them, right? You might, uh, have you ever seen in a um, hotel where they have the luminaire and it has a built-in receptacle? That's fine. Obviously, that doesn't have anything to do with the spacing requirements. It's an additional, for your convenience, another receptacle, but it's certainly not gonna meet the spacing requirement. Now, let's look at A. All right, so where's this one at? All right, locate this one's at six feet right now. For some reason, they put this one up high. Maybe this is for a flat screen TV, okay. Although receptacles located more than five and a half feet above the floor are permitted, and you could do that, I mean, you could put that receptacle above your cabinet, let's say in the kitchen to do like accent lighting, um, you can put a receptacle up high for something else, whatever you want. It still just can't meet the spacing requirement. It's an additional one. You put whatever you want, but you still got to maintain the spacing stuff, right? All right, so that's what that is. So this is six and a half feet, so that's not going to qualify. So that's why you have this one down here. 
Okay. B, this one, no, notice this one's inside of a cabinet. And so if this was six foot, 12 foot spacing, and it ended up being behind a cabinet, so then the carpenter comes in, or the cabinet folks come in and cut it in back here, and your inspector comes in and fails you, why? Because these inside of a cabinet or cupboard do not count the same as these ones out here that are for the spacing, okay? You can have one in there, but it's additional, it's extra, okay? It doesn't meet the spacing requirement. So that's what we're talking about with B. Although receptacle outlets within a cabinet or cupboards are permitted, they are not to count for the required receptacles in 210.52. They're just there. If you want to have extra ones, that's fine. Now, note, height requirements for wall receptacles are not defined. Okay, so nothing says that they can have to be at 10 inches, 4 inches, 2 inches, 1 inch, 14 inches, 16 inches, 18 inches, whatever, five and a half feet or less, or less than five and a half feet. Have them where you want, okay? Um, personally, I always put mine at 16 inches to the top, but there are some people that put them at 18 inches to the top. The code doesn't care. That is going to be fair. Now, where, would, may it, where may this make a difference? Well, if you're doing dwelling units, for example, in a multifamily building, then they may have an ADA requirement, and your local jurisdiction might have adopted that, that says the receptacles and switches and all that kind of stuff have to be at certain heights, because of an ADA, not because of the NEC, but because of ADA, okay? So that is for the Disability Act and that type of thing. But that is typically something you'll see in a multifamily dwelling, in the individual dwelling units in apartment complexes and things like that. Not so much in a dwelling unit, okay? You wouldn't see those things. All right, what about balcony handrails? Okay, so this is an example just like the one before. So this is a no-brainer. Uh, here is a balcony overlooking, let's say, a living room, and maybe this is a loft area. It says, A, a receptacle floor box must be listed specifically for the type of floor in which it is installed. That is, again, 314.27B. And, of course, this is considered wall space, so we're measuring this fixed wall space here. I have to have it. Now, I obviously can't put it in here in the balusters. That'd look kind of stupid. So I'm going to put it in the floor. But it has to be within what? It has to be within 18 inches of this rail. Okay. So a floor receptacle may be required if the balcony handrail is longer than six feet and the area is... Uh, and the area is one listed in 210.52a. So it's one of those areas that we were talking about, living room, dining room, things like that, or similar area. And in this case, if this is longer than six feet, all right, to the end, then obviously I have to have a receptacle within six feet of the end of this, um, this balcony rail, okay? I, I tell people to think of this as, forget that it's a balcony. Forget that that's a rail. It's a wall, and something could conceivably be put there, whether it's a table with a lamp on it or something. Again, we don't want extension cords, so we want to make sure that we have the receptacles and treat that as wall space. And if you have to put in the floor ones, do. Just make sure you're putting in the right type of floor box. And it'll have an associated cover that is also part of that listed for a floor box. All right, now... What about if you encounter electric baseboard heat? Now, the National Electrical Code specifically doesn't say that you can't, if you have baseboard heat, electric baseboard heat, it doesn't specifically say that you can't put a receptacle above it. However, the manufacturer's instructions will tell you that you can't put it above it. Okay, so, and if it's the manufacturer's instructions, you, you have to follow that, okay? Heat does rise up, and if you plug something in there, the cords would drape down and potentially catch on fire. So, typically, uh, you're going to see this in the manufacturer's instructions. But, again, this is a long baseboard, right? Let's look at this thing. This is 16 feet long. So, if I'm measuring around the room, I got to have a receptacle in there. So, this might be a problem. So, if you see A, it says a baseboard heater... More than 12 feet in length does not eliminate the requirement for 210.52A1 receptacle. The receptacle is still required. A receptacle is still required for the wall space containing a baseboard heater. So it might be something you have to put in the floor. Um, or 
You can get baseboard heaters with sections in there that are designed to put a receptacle in it. And you could have the receptacle built into the baseboard. Now, it's not supplied by the power that's coming to the baseboard heat. You still have to bring your branch circuit that you're using for the receptacles around the room. You'll come into that specific section of that baseboard to power that receptacle. Okay? But again, most of the manufacturer of these baseboard heaters will tell you, do not put a receptacle above my baseboard heater. Okay? So note, listed or labeled equipment must be installed and used per any instructions included in the listing or the labeling. That's a 1103B. So I could buy one of these baseboards and it has a section again in the middle that may hold a receptacle and boom, I can meet this rule and not have a problem, okay? Now, here's the, here's the informational note, folks. It reminds us, listed baseboard heaters, including instructions, may not permit their installation below a receptacle outlet. Okay, and where does it say that? Where does it remind you of that? So you have to go look at what the manufacturers say. That is an informational note under 210.52. And it's also, again, reiterated under 424.9 in an informational note to do that. If the manufacturer doesn't say you that there's a problem with it, then you could do it. I would just use a little common sense. And since heat rises, I would probably put one out here on the floor within 18 inches of the wall. Or I would get a baseboard that is has a receptacle that's integral, uh, a component of that baseboard. And they do make those. Okay, So those are the things that, that I would do if I ran into that specific situation. Also remember, this typically applies to electric baseboards. You're typically not going to find these instructions for gas type of baseboards. Um, so again, can they be above a gas uh, baseboard heater? Uh, yeah. Code doesn't say anything against it. Uh, you still got to look at the manufacturer's instructions, but I can tell you most of the ones that I've seen when it comes to electric baseboards will say not to put a receptacle, put the baseboard below a receptacle. Okay. And they do offer some other options in order to do it. My point here is, just because it's inconvenient for you and they put that baseboard in there, you still have to follow the receptacle requirements for spacing. Still have to have it. Can't say, what am I supposed to do, Mr. Inspector? The baseboard's there. I can't put a receptacle above it. I guess I don't need one in that wall. Mm, not the case. Still need to do it. All right, and here you go. Here's a good example of one. So this is, I'm glad this is here. I forgot that it was here, but I'm glad it's here. So receptacles mounted in a baseboard heater. They do make these, okay? So A, it says permanently installed electric baseboard heaters equipped with factory installed outlets or outlets provided as a separate listed assembly it means you can buy the baseboards and you can buy this piece that these baseboards connect to that holds a receptacle, right? Um, by the manufacturer shall be permitted as the required outlets for the wall space utilized by such permanently installed baseboard. So it, you know, that's perfectly fine. You're still meeting your spacing requirements, but this typically would come from a manufacturer and you see right here, but this receptacle is not powered by the circuit for the baseboard. This receptacle, again, shall not be connected to the heater circuit, okay? It's gonna be connected to the regular branch circuit. So typically what happens is you have a cover you pull off or the receptacle mounts in it, and then the back of it has knockouts, and you gotta make sure that you route your, your branch circuits, your non-metallic sheet cable as you're going around the wall, poke it in to this receptacle, and you come back in and go out and continue on to the, to the other receptacles, okay? And you'll make everything up in that specifically designated space, and this would meet the spacing rules. So if I had a receptacle here, and I can go up to 12 feet, that might be that one right there. And then from here, I can go another 12 feet and put another one over here if I want, okay? That would be okay. Again, factory, it's made this way. Or you can buy baseboards that come together and does have an assembly that goes in the middle that gives you that room to have that receptacle that goes there. And that is required to meet that spacing. Uh, you just, again, you can't just say, oh crap, I got a baseboard, board, a baseboard heater on that whole wall I don't need no receptacle. Yes, you do. Okay, yes, you do. All right.
Okay, so this gets more into the receptacle boxes, so we're kind of out of placement stuff, so we're gonna come back to me. And we haven't talked about kitchens, right? So let's come back to me real quick. So we're gonna cover the receptacle boxes and all the nuances about the metal boxes, grounding, bonding, and all that kind of good stuff. We're gonna cover all that in other episodes. Um, so hopefully you got something out of the placement. This is your general provisions. We're gonna get into the placement for kitchen receptacles uh, and all that type of stuff and spacing in another video. Cause again, I wanna keep these videos, uh, you know, less, about an hour or less and uh, to help you be able to absorb it and, and watch it in a full sitting. But I want you to make sure you subscribe to our FastTracksTube.com uh, because we're going to have other videos and we will go into these other details. So just hunt for them and you'll be able to find them. So we're going to go into the receptacle requirements for kitchens and things like that in the next episode. So hopefully you got something out of this episode, folks. Till next time, stay safe. God bless. And again, if you want to get a great course on learning the National Electrical Code, just go right here and watch our demo. FastTrackSystem.com. Click on the Fast Tracks Black course. Watch the demo and you'd be amazed how this program has flashcards built into it. It makes it so easy to remember things. Uh, it has a read me feature where it'll read all the information for you and you just listen, kind of that ballistic approach. Um, you can do bookmarks, you can increase the size, you can print it off, you can do anything you want with it. You own it for a whole year. You can print every page if you want. There's just so much here and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night if you join our program. I appreciate you all and thank you for making Electrical Code Academy a success. Uh, I couldn't do this without you. So I do appreciate and uh, every one of you, I will never take you for granted. I appreciate you. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless.